Hey, Jenya. Hello. Long time no see. How are you doing? Good to see you. How are you doing? Um, good, good. Kids better. Went back to school today. Oh, that's great. Do you, do you, <clears throat> you guys manage to avoid getting infected? Um, it seems so, so far. I keep testing. Thankfully, Northwestern is very good about having on-campus testing that's very accessible. So I tested negative last time today. That's good. It seems like the case numbers are coming down a lot, but I'm wondering if that's just because people are doing the self-tests. I don't think it's just that. Case numbers are coming down, but the their absolute values are still quite high. Uh, yeah. So I think your you know the individual risk is is non-trivial. Yeah. Do you want me to test slides or something? Uh, yes. Yes, please. Please. Okay. Let's try. It. <clears throat> Why is it asking me to share a whiteboard? No, don't, no, 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 don't do that. That is, not, that is not the desired thing. Do you see, how does this look? You see the full yeah, screen? And, yeah, and can you do the slideshow view? Yeah, good, perfect. Sure. Let's, okay, let's give it a shot. Yeah, looks good. Okay, and you see my Yes, yes. Great. Okay. There's nothing nothing too crazy here. I don't have uh, weird animations or anything like that. Cool. Yeah, thanks for doing this. Of course, my pleasure. I've been uh I haven't managed to attend a lot of these, but I've been like watching them. You had so many great people participate over the pandemic. Oh well, yeah, it's been fun. Um it's good to learn new things each week. So you really every week without a break for the whole pandemic? Yeah. We took a one week break during Christmas and then one week during uh, Chinese New Year because I'm living in China now. So yeah. Uh, yeah. That. Happy New Year, by the way. Uh, thanks. Thanks. <laughs> we had to celebrate it because one of our, it's one of our kids' year. He's, uh -huh. okay. 12. He's going to be 12. So he's 11. Ah, so yeah. And I turned 12 in this year. Yeah, cool. Yeah, my daughter's a uh, tiger also. What's your uh, your plan is uh, uh, more, you're gonna stay longer? Um, I, I really need to get back, uh, but right now there's a lot of travel restrictions, so it's a little bit hard to get back, um, okay. but eventually. And also th there's essentially no COVID cases here. So it's, that's- I know, good. it's pretty- uh... It's pretty amazing as we're, you know, beaten up by this last year of schooling. Yeah, um, but it's, it is pretty intense. So I have a little bit of a cold right now, but like I, I dare not go to the store to buy like a cold medicine because then they like, if you, if you do that, they like put a little note on your thing that they track you. And then you, they, cause everyone, you have like, everyone has on their phone, a code like green, yellow, or red. And you can go anywhere if you're green, but if you're yellow, you can't go. So like if you buy a cold medicine, they change your code to yellow and then you have to go to the hospital to get checked out, but you can't get to the hospital with a yellow. So it's all it's sort of this crazy thing. Wow. Yeah. That sounds, sounds complicated, but nice to have no COVID essentially. Yeah. There's maybe like 20 to 50 cases per day in the whole country. Yeah. It's like, 20 cases per day in my university last week. And that's a big improvement. Yeah. I get emails like in my building uh, um, at Stanford, I get emails like there's a positive case. Oh, we you don't have to do anything people can, but if, if it was, this was in China, if there's like a single case, like in a city, they lock down that, that, that city. Uh, am I going second? Uh, yes, please. Is that okay? Yeah, of course. I inferred that from the layout of yeah. the cute little advertisement. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't always mean that, but it's usually not. Hi, Chenju. How's the Chicago winter? 
Oh, covered in snow, snow right outside oh. the window. Um, oh. It was pretty chilly for a few days. It's it's fine though. I don't mind Chicago winters so much because there's a lot of sun in contrast to Boston winters. Yeah, oh, there's that gray. Where did she go? Hey, Chenju. Can you hear me? Maybe not. Okay, she's connected. Oh. Oh, okay. Hi, Chenju. Can you hear me? Hi, yeah, yeah, yeah. Good, good, me? good, good. Yes, loud and clear. Uh, okay. How are you doing? Good. <laughs> and you enjoy your holidays? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you want to test your slides? Uh, yeah, sure. So, so now I share my screen, right? Yes. Okay. Can you see it? Looks great. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Looks good. Okay. I guess it's working. Cool. You're in Shenzhen? Yes. Nice. <laughs> but recently it's also very cold in Shenzhen. It's on Yu Euro. Hmm. Yeah, I went to Guilin. And I thought it was gonna be really warm, but it was super cold and yeah. wet. It was be beautiful, but it's too cold. Yeah, this year is, is kind of unusual. Normally it's around 20 uh, degree like that. It's um, much warmer. I, I might go to Shaman next weekend or something like that, just to get somewhere warm. Mm. Uh, hi, Jenya. <laughs> hi, nice to meet you. Uh, I'm Tenji, yeah. <laughs> You can stop sharing your screen now if you want, should you? Uh, ten, ten, oh, okay, okay. Um, I just have like an introductory slide before. Okay. How long have you had your lab there? Hmm? How Sorry? long have you had your lab? Um, two and a half years. Great. Hi. 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 Hello. Hey, Hi. Hey. Just, uh, just we just back from a uh, long holiday. Yeah. yeah. Happy New Year. Yeah, yeah. Happy New Year. Tiger Year. Yeah, it's a good year. I got a tiger kid, so we be <laughs> awesome. Yes. Nice. I have a tiger and a bull. Oh, yeah, all kinds of, kind of both this year, Ron. I I got a tiger and a dragon. Oh, oh nice! I, I'm I'm dragon. Yeah. <laughs> You're dragon. So? Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, me too. You you too, right? You too. So yeah. <laughs> we're yeah. here. Nice. Nice. Right. I went to Guilin for the. Uh, Chinese New Year. Sweet. So Aaron, what's the uh, what's the streaming situation? The whole thing streamed, streamed Q and A. 
Uh, it goes uh, in the yeah. Air, or what's the what's the gist? Yeah. So the gist is it's live. So if people. Some, some people, for some reason, like to watch it on YouTube rather than here live, and then it's up there, and then if speakers don't want it to be up there, I can take it down. So some people in Europe can watch it later when they wake up, so up to you. Yeah, it's hard to uh, make this time for everybody, right? Yeah. Oh, almost, yeah. We, um, nearly everybody has the questions. Yeah. Some put questions in the chat bar. So, yeah. I'm trying to figure out. I I Chen Chen Ju is uh is uh, alumni of Kangsheng. I have same college, Tongji College of Medicine. I just figure out. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah. Kang is Kang is an MD, right? Yeah, I, uh, uh, Chen Ju is uh, a MD PhD, but actually, so the, the same has like them. Uh, I believe as a as a bachelor degree and a PhD. Program. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, have some. They went to some same college, the Toji College of Medicine. That's one of the like four, three or four a medical college in China. Most uh, prestigious, prestigious one is Xihe, Xiangya, Tongji, and somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know it very well. <laughs> yeah, try to learn this. <laughs> so the schools aren't back. They're still on break, or are they back now? Uh, the graduate student is still in break. It will be back next week also. Yeah. But the post is uh, other stuff that are come back. Okay. Yeah. The, my kids are back in school. They had off one week, but now really? for, the other, for the local kids get longer off. Yeah, they just supposed to have also have some, I like, guess, uh, check, check COVID-19 COVID test or whatever, a serious. And uh, they're not allowed to come back, come out for a couple of weeks, something. Oh, really? Uh, yes, I heard. If okay. you if you come out of the Shanghai, you need to have some tests, whatever. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, we took a test to leave Shanghai to go to Guilin, and then we took a test when we came back. Mm -hmm. I don't I even I don't even test the results anymore. I don't even check the results yeah, anymore. Yeah, that's why right. in Nerma, yeah, yeah, you 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 don't need to know because <laughs> <laughs> they'll, come, they'll come take you away. <laughs> yeah, yeah, don't they'll, worry. They'll find it. you. <laughs> Hi, Jing, Happy New Year. Hi, Happy New Year. Yeah, we just come back from holiday. I uh, know you guys are all first having day. holiday. So yeah, yesterday is uh first day, first work day in the Tiger Year. The f well, it should be yesterday, right? Yeah, well, yeah. that's yeah, too Monday, short. Monday. Usually, you get two weeks off, isn't it? Uh, but for for staffs, well, students get two weeks, but for staffs, um, post all we gonna go one week. Oh. Not cut short used to be. We only yeah. had three yeah. days. Used oh, to yeah. be. <laughs> um, Aaron, watching enough Olympics? Yeah, oh. it's great watching Olympics in China. It's yeah, yeah. Everybody, so do you get to? So there's a uh, what? There's a skater, a skater who switched to China and that, but like yeah. her her father is now a professor at Qinghua. Yeah, I was like just going to ask you how your kids think about it. Eileen Gu. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's No, so that's a so she I want to try to recruit going to be my your lab Stanford, Stanford student. Yes. Yeah, Stanford. I'm going to get her into my lab for Stanford. <laughs> well, how do you know she's interested? <laughs> how could she not be interested? <laughs> I see. Okay. Do it. Yeah, well, definitely. That's good. Um, tell her it's important to learn about neurodegeneration. Uh, we already know she has uh, already uh, a celebrity has uh, more than the good medalist had uh, uh, an advertisement of a celebrity. Really somewhere like, uh, I don't know whatever uh, happened in the US, but you have imagine how many 
uh, uh, she, she's a, it's a, I think he was somewhere a bodyguard with, with, with her. <laughs> we heard like over 10, 11 advertisements. So. Wow. Okay. Uh, well, Erin, I'm not sure you can afford the bodyguard if she works in your lab. Yeah, yeah maybe not. Mm. Right. It's, how come you just heard? I thought your kids will tell you right away. Um, I don't know. No. Yeah, just yeah I found it from YouTube, actually. Mm -hmm. All right, Erin, let's get started. Yeah. Okay, okay. Yes, right. okay. Um, <laughs> Hi everyone, welcome back. Uh, happy Chinese New Year. Off to a great start with great neuroscience. Um, before we get started with these talks, um, advertisement for next week, we have uh, two great speakers, uh, Nasha Abu Maria, AKA Nata, AKA Nash, our, our good friend from Fudan, and uh, Norbert, Norbert Hejos from Indiana University uh, talking um, about cool uh, behaviors and circuits underlying those behaviors. And um, now we'll start with Chen Zhu Yi and uh, Zilong will in introduce her. Oh, just a reminder, please. Um, uh, we have lots of speaking slots available. So uh, we're, we're looking for uh, to hear your latest, greatest research. So let us know if you want to talk about your project. Great. So welcome everybody to the Tiger Year uh, New Zoom. Okay. Uh, so it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, uh, Professor Chen Ju Yi. So she's uh, now a social professor in Sun Yixian University, also known as the Zhongshan University in Guangzhou. So uh, Chen Ju has a very interest, very interesting, amazing uh, 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 experience of teaching uh, and uh, education and the professional uh, edu pro experience. Let me try to explain. So uh, she graduated from uh, some Tongji College as the one. Uh, you know, the concern graduated from. Uh, so after a bachelor degree, he, she went to an interesting MD PhD program in China. So where his joint program has studied PhD in China and MD in Germany. So, in, uh, so after she fin finished a PhD in China, she went to uh, Tutingen, so has her uh, MD, MD training. So uh, she's a, a very rare species in MD PhD in, in China. So after MD PhD, uh, uh, Chen Ju is still interested in basic uh, research in uh, glial cells. So she went to uh, uh, France in the College of France. He, he worked with Professor Jerome, so studying the uh, interesting role of glia in uh, all kinds of neuro the neurological disorders. Uh, after PhD in France, also he she went to a, a brief postdoc in Singapore, working with uh, Professor Carlos Ibnes, also start starting interesting uh, signaling in Alzheimer's disease. So uh, uh, last uh, two and a half years, so, so she started her own lab, her own lab in uh, Sun Yixian University in Guangzhou. Uh, already she has interesting, uh, initiated interesting uh, in discoveries in her own lab. So today we were happy to uh, uh, to listen to uh, her latest and try to her talk title. That's what is that? Uh, so uh, the crosstalk between exercise and oligodendrocyte in early life stress. So welcome to you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so let me share my screen. Sure. All right, great. Uh, take away. Uh, can you see the cover of, my, of the first screen? Yes. Yeah, no problem. Oh. Take away. OK. Uh, thank you, Professor Choi and also Aaron for organizing this Zoom talk. It's my pleasure to present our recent work here which is about the crosstalk between atrocytes and oleodendrocytes in early life stress. Ooh, it's not working. Oh, okay. Uh, it's well acknowledged that the normal brain function relies upon not only the neurons, but also the precise coordination of these glial cells. And among different glial cell types, atrocyte uh, is definitely a major population in the brain. And they can be organized as a network through this gap junction, uh, through this connecting based gap junctions to keep the brain homeostasis. And they are involved in the metabolic support or trophy support to coordinate the local neural activities. And they can also allow uh, signals such as calcium propagation among atrocytes and communication with neurons or other glial cell types. More recently, it has been reported that 
Ultrasound can also regulate blood flow and uh, modulate synaptic activity um, and leading to subsequent behavioral outcomes. And uh, in the brain pathologies, um, ultrasound maldevelopment and dysfunction, including the dysregulation of uh, uh, this network, uh, network protein connections can affect neural function leading to subsequent uh, cognitive or behavioral uh, impairment. So another glial type, oleodental size, can produce the myelin sheaths insulating the axon, um, neural axons. And they are differentiated from these oleodental side precursor cells, we named the OPC here for short. So OPC are uh, ubiquitously distributed throughout the brain, even in the regions with sparse bindination. They can not only function as the precursors of uh, myelinating oleodental sites, but they can also play, on, uh, play a myelin independent role in maintaining brain functions. And the previous studies have indicated that defective atrocytes can strongly impair OPC developmental function in some neural disorders. This reminds us to take into consideration the interaction between different blue cell types instead of focusing on one single cell type when exploring the mechanism of the brain pathologies. So here we focused on the early life stress related neuropsychiatric disorders. As we know, the movement of migrant laborers has resulted in an increasing number of these left behind children who suffer from early life stress due to the emotional or physical neglect. A study showed that already uh, exposure to this early life stress is directly implicated in the neuropsychiatric disorders in adulthood, uh, such as um, emotional or, uh, or psychosocial symptoms, including inclinations to impulsive behavior or anxiety or depression and so on. And however, the mechanism remains unclear. Intriguingly, uh, studies found that altered atrocytes are often associated with aberrant or lentocytes in neuropsychiatric disorders, such as in major depressive disorder or in schizophrenia and so on. Then we asked how these glial cells involved in the pathogenesis of these early stress related neuropsychiatric disorders. To understand this question, we established maternal isolation model, a, rodent, a typical rodent model equivalent to early life stress. And the traditional maternal isolation model are established by separating the mouse pups from their mothers and little mates. However, these traditional controls uh, not only have regular caring, but also access to a milk feed from the mothers. The, to distinguish the effects from this um, um, caring, uh, lack of caring from the nutrient deficiency, we established a new control named the father only here, in which the mouse perhaps stayed with their fathers who can provide parental care but not milk, right? So in our as in our include maternal isolation model, a series of these behavioral tests were carried out and uh, we found that these isolated mice displayed higher rates of these imp impulsive, depressive, or anxiety-related behaviors, but no cognitive um, impairments shown by NOR here, which mirrors, sorry. can you see the first screen? Oh, okay, nice work. Mm -hmm. Which mirrored the, the early life stress-related symptoms. We then examined the histological and functional changes in the atrocytes. Actually, the morphology of atrocytes was significantly changed uh, in the isolated mice compared to father only mice in the brain regions of hippocampus. And uh, in particular, the branches of the atrocytes were, were, were reduced. However, the number of these atrocytes, uh, of these atrocytes remained unaltered, shown by both BLBP staining and also GFAP staining here. Um, both BLBP and GFAP are atrocytic markers. And then we detected the atrocyte network markers gap junction proteins, connecting 43 and uh, connecting 30, which are predominantly expressed in atrocytes. And both were downregulated in our model uh, compared to the father-only control. 
And then we also detected the ultrasound uh, network function, gap junction, um, by using this FRAP, which is short for friends recovery after the operation. Basically, these acute brain sizes were loaded with this small molecular dye named superautomy 11 SR11, which can selectively taken up by atrocytes and then diffuse through the gap junction channels. After photobridging, these friends can recover uh, from the atrocyte network through gap junction channels. So here we found that the first recover was slower in the isolation mice compared to the father only control mice, indicating a compromised gap junction communication in our isolation in our isolated model. And then calcium imaging showed that um, in isolated mice, the intracellular calcium activity in the atrocytes uh, was downregulated, uh, indicating that uh, the atrocyte activity was also suppressed in our isolated mice. Okay, we, we then examined the oleodendrocytes in our model. Both oleo 2 positive and NG2 positive cells uh, were reduced in our isolated mice. And in the hippocampus, actually, the same region where atrocytes are found to be changed, indicating that the, to the total number of hippocampal OPC was reduced in, in our isolated mice as NG2 is a kind of specific marker for OPC. In addition, the immunostaining for OLU2 and uh, CC1 show that this ratio between CC1 positive and OLU2 positive cells was unaltered, suggesting the proportion of these mature oligodendrocytes was not changed since CC1 is a mature oligodendrocyte marker. So this indicated that the differentiation capacity of OPC remained intact while the number of OPC reduced. And then we also observed the isolated mice display a repressed neural activity shown by lower CFOS level here um, in, in the hippocampus without change in the neural numbers seen by new here indicating a repressed neural activity in our currently isolated mice. Finally, we checked microglia also, since in previous studies concerning psychiatric disorders, it has been noted that microglia are often activated. However, in our model, the number and the morphology stayed by IB1 here uh, were not altered. Together, our input metamol isolation model exhibited neuropsychiatric behaviors, together with significant atrocyte uh, mild development, decreased oligodendrocyte cell number, and uh, suppressed neural activity. Then we asked, how did these abnormalities occur in our isolation model? To understand it, we chronologically traced these abnormalities in isolation mice uh, at earlier stages from P3 to P10, according to the developmental timeline of these uh, different cells. And uh, first, we found that this reduction of OPC number took place as early as P4 due to the reduced OPC proliferation shown by OLU2 and uh, K67 staining. And then at as early as P7, atrocytic features dis displayed shrunken morphology including shortened branches and decreased uh, immune reactivity of BLBT staining and GFAP and GFP signal, which were also accompanied by the downregulation in the atrocyte network marker COMEX-143 um, in our isolated mice compared to the control at P7. Okay. While a decrease of neural activity as shown by c level in the hippocampus was detected by until P P10. So uh, the sequential occurrence of this OPC number reduction, compromised atrocyte development, as well as the impaired neural activity led us to hypothesis that uh, this OPC re re population reduction might lead to atrocyte mold development in currently isolated mice. To test our hypothesis, we first generated OPC ablation mice 
by crossing PDGFR for Korea mice with DTA mice. So ODU2 and NG2 staining confirmed the efficient depletion of OPC in the hippocampus in these mice. And then we found that similar to uh, that of parental isolated mice, atrocytes also um, exhibited shrunken morphologies in these OPC activation mice shown by ALDH1, L1, HFP signal, and, or, and also the lower expression level of this network protein connex in 43, uh, which were uh, along with reduced calcium uh, activity in atrocytes and abrogated gap junction channel function in the atrocyte network, suggesting a role of OPC in regulating atrocyte development and function. Then we asked, how does OPC affect atrocyte? We then cultured atrocytes with OPC and found that uh, OPC, atrocyte co culture with OPC can express higher level of this network, uh, network protein connection 43, which is in agreement with our uh, previous in vivo results. To verify whether this kind of interaction took place in a direct contact or an indirect manner, we treated atrocytes with this uh, OPC or odontocyte derived conventional medium, we named CM here, or uh, the extractive membrane protein, we named MP here. And then we found that only this um, OPC conventional medium treatment was able to significantly increase the uh, Comexin 43 expression in atrocytes and uh, enhanced the gap junctional communication in atrocytes in vitro here detected by this script loading dye transfer assay. And also um, the castle imaging showed that this OPC conventional medium elevated the castle activity in atrocytes. Um, so this data suggests that OPC promoted atrocyte development and function in a parochial manner. Then uh, to further identify the underlying mechanism and which factors release from OPC are involved, we use this RNC to profile the transcriptome in atrocytes purified from P7 isolation model and their related control mice. And then we found that two uh, highly related signaling pathways were identified, um, including REP1 and uh, WIND. However, the WIND, but not the REP1, was uh, reported to participate in atrocyte activation and uh, uh, wind is also altered in the abnormal atrocytes induced by stress. So we focused on this signaling. Indeed, we found that um, the wind beta catenin uh, pathway rated genes and also the atrocyte function genes were down regulated in our parentally isolated mice. However, the uh, expression of these wind ligands in OPC and the wind receptors and ligands in atrocytes from our isolated mice were not changed. Hence, we speculated that the down regulation of the total amount of wind ligands caused by this OPC population reduction was responsible for the down regulation of wind with catenin signaling in atrocytes and the subsequent atrocyte mode development uh, in our parentally isolated mice. We first verify if OPC expressed when ligands could promote atrocyte development in vitro. So cultured atrocytes were treated with a serial OPC derived with ligands, uh, including uh, when 4A, uh, 10A, and so on. And then we found that uh, when 7A, 7B, and their combination uh, can significantly increase the atrocyte mature marker, including GFAP and Tonis 43, and also the atrocyte functional genes and the wind beta catenin signaling related molecules, which was brought by this antagonist of wind beta catenin signaling XAV939. And uh, we also found that Win 7A, 7B, and uh, Win 7A plus B can elevate the expression level of commencing for in atrocytes and enhance the decoupling uh, in, in the atrocyte network in vitro. Uh, indeed, 
we found the reduction of this win 7A and win 7B expression in both model, in both uh, parental athletic mice and OPC ablation mice. Okay, so this suggesting that uh, atrocyte de development can be regulated by this OPC derived uh, win 7A and win 7B ligands. To further confirm this role of OPC drive with 7A, 7B in atrocytes, we conditionally knock out uh, with 7A or with 7B in OPC and by crossing these frog mice with um, PGFR for CREA mice. Uh, PGFR uh, CREA is a, a specific uh, OPC reporter, just to remind you. So, for example, here we induced it by tamoxifen nutrition uh, from P4 up to P7. And then we examine the histological change in this uh, win 7B conditional knockout mice. Consistent with our findings in parentally isolated mice and OPC ablation mice, this conditional knockout mice um, also displayed a shrunken morphology diminished atrocyte of branches by BLBP staining and also GFAP staining here, and also lower expression of uh, connecting 43 compared to control at P7. Um, the neural activity as shown by Staples level here was also decreased in this in 7B condition of cow mice. An open field experiment also showed that these mice displayed anxiety-related behaviors. However, here I have to mention that no such phenotypes could be found in win 7A condition of cow mice. This might be partially explained by the fact that OPC really significantly less with 7A compared to 7B, and atrocytes might be more sensitive to 7B. Uh, this we, we haven't checked yet. In addition, the number and morphology of oligodendrocytes uh, shown by only 2 staining, NG2 or MVP staining here, were not altered in with 7B conventional cow mice. And also the morphology and uh, number of microglia shown by IV1 staining here were not altered in our conditional cow mice. And finally, we also detected uh, the vasculature in this mice by using CD31 staining, since win 7 a or win 7 b have been reported to mediate brain endothelium or vasculature developmental function in the white matter, which may influence atrocyte development and neural function through insufficient oxygen or nutrition supplementations. However, here, uh, no differences were found in the vasculature morphology in the hippocampus region of uh, this WIM7B conventional compass. Then we can exclude the possibility of this endothelial dysfunction uh, in our model. At last, we wondered whether the pharmacological intervention, for instance, the when 7A plus B replacement could rescue the atrocyte network abnormalities in our parentally isolated model. Then we micro-injected uh, when 7A and when 7B into the hippocampus uh, to the isolated mice at P14. After four days at P18, we analyzed the histological change 500 micrometers distal from the injection site and then we found that the wind beta catenin signaling atrocytes was uh, elevated uh, after the micro injection of this wind 7A and uh, wind 7B. And this micro injection of wind 7A plus B was able to focally rescue uh, the atrocyte morphological immaturation as shown by increased branch number here and also the increased expression level of comet simple compared to the controls, suggesting a possible supportive way for early life stress related neuropsychiatric disorders. Uh, in conclusions, uh, altered atrocytes are associated with aberrant OPC in our improved early life stress mouse model and reduced OPC population derived with ligands including with 7A and with 7B, in particular with 7B, are responsible for the wind beta catenin mediated atrocyte maldevelopment leading to neural dysfunction and uh, neuropsychological symptoms. So the most important point I want to highlight here is that our work demonstrates a wind paracrine dependent 
but mining independent role in OPC in regulating atrocide development during the brain development team in brain pathology or brain pathologies. And this atrocyte OPC crosstalk can be then in implicated in the pathogenesis of early life, early life stress related neuropsychiatric disorders. So here I will give my acknowledgments to my collaborators from the third military medical university, Professor Niu Jianqing and Professor Xiaolan. Uh, they are experts in the field of dental science. That's why we collaborate to uncover this interaction between atrocytes and oligodendrocytes. And most of the experiments were performed by Dr. Wang Yuxing. <clears throat> he was a PhD student of Professor Niu and Professor Xiao. And Dr. Sui Xun, he was my postdoc, and now he's a senior research fellow in my lab. And many thanks for the funding support. So lastly, please give me 10 seconds for my advertisement. This is my team uh, located in Shenzhen, China. And uh, these are our lab mascots. And please contact me by this email address if you are interested in our postdoc position. Okay, that's all. Thank you very much for your attention. Great, thanks, Sanji, for beautiful work. Um, now we're open for questions. Can I ask a question? Sure, sure, go ahead. Yeah, my name is Chen from the, the Chinese Academy of Science. Uh, we are neighborhood, I'm in Zhongshan. Oh. So, <laughs> beautiful talk. Actually, I want to ask though, I think when you do the isolation of the pups, you might do the man made fe uh, feeding of the mice, right? Yes. So, my question is how do you keep the consistency of each mice? How do you keep this model re reliable from the different researchers? Uh, actually, uh, okay, let me go back to the model side and. Uh, Actually, it's a traditional. Uh, it's a traditional uh, isolation model. Uh, just to separate each pup at a cage for from nine a.m. until uh, five p.m. and then uh, give give it back to their parents. And we added the father only to distinguish the nutrient deficiency, um, because the traditional controls they they. These pups stayed with their parents, uh, including their mothers, so they could get some uh, milk feed. Yeah, and uh, okay. Um, this is not a totally isolated. You still give some the pups back to the mom, right? Uh, mom. Yeah, sure, sure. Otherwise, they cannot survive. Yeah, they stayed okay. with their mothers, uh, I think, yeah, 16 hours at least. Great, great. Oh, thank you. So uh, uh, the second question is, uh, you found the C4 is uh, reduced actually in this model. So I guess you cannot, you, you didn't different uh, uh, the neurons and the glia. So have you ever checked the neurons change in this model? Actually, we, we did this C4 staining co-labeled co with new staining. So this indicates that this C4 level reduced in neurons but not uh, glial cells. Okay. Oh, okay, okay, got it. Okay, thank you so much. Great. Uh, no, yeah. Mm. Yeah, thanks. Question. Great. Yeah, go um, ahead. Hi, Chenji. Uh, really beautiful work. Um, excellent work. And um, I have two questions. One is with the PDGFR alpha um, CRE DTA part. So when OPCs are killed, there are dead cells in the brain, and uh, dead cell could be um, activating microglia and uh, astrocytes. I wonder if that has any potential role in affecting astrocyte um, uh, development. And another question is uh, PDGFR alpha CRE also label um, uh, uh, parasites. And I wonder if you think parasites may have a role in this. Um, let me ask you a second question first. <laughs> um, actually, we did, we validate this uh, uh, specific tactic in oligodendral lineage cells uh, in this PDGFR alpha CRE ER mice. Um, by uh, labeling or uh, by using this Rosa YFP uh, mice, um, actually this this um, I I I think I prepared a slide, but anyway, um, this um, and, and we co-labeled with uh, different markers for different glial cell types, including O2, new and GFAP, and also um, other cell art cells. 
And then we found that uh, more than 96, if I remember, more than 96% of the uh, cells uh, collaborate with what FP positive and uh, all the two positive are um, uh, all the dendrolytic cells. And very, very few cells are collaborate with new one and uh, YFP positive. And only 4% uh, or 3% of cells, uh, due to the um, morphology of these cells, uh, we regard it as uh, parasite-like uh, uh, cells. Yeah, so I think the, the specific the specific targeting in, in oligodendrolytic cells are already validated. Yeah, and your first question, sorry. Oh, so with the DTA killing of OPCs, do you think that cells being around could have an effect on uh, astrocytes? Um, this in this DTA mice, actually, uh, we cross PGFR5 uh, create mice with DTA mice, and then we checked uh, actually each cell type in these mice, and we didn't find any change in uh, at least the morphology and the number of astrocytes in our model in these mice. Yeah, but only the reduction of NG2 and O2 uh, positive cell number uh, in, in this DKA mice. So we, we think it's a good model to apply to eliminate OPC in, uh, in, in, in label. Okay, so I, I wonder if um, the, you use DTA to kill OPCs, right? So then the dead cells are around in the brain. And um, so I wonder if the effect you see is really due to a reduction in OPC uh, or um, dead cells um, making microglia and astrocytes reactive? Um, actually, I think it's uh, just the elimination of OPC in the effect from the elimination of OPC. Um, but not from the dead cells of OPC because we also stained, we used the tunnel staining to check if there um, if there are, there are some 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 cells, some OPC um, dead or yeah. It's just the, the number reduction of OPC in, in this ablation ablation mice. Thank you. All right, and more questions? I might get quick comments uh, before ending. So uh, yeah, so uh, my question is related to the previous one. So I'm um, maybe like one of our comments. So uh, I, I'm curious about the more even upper uh, stream of the signal. So is there mm -hmm. only pure less OPC leading to the uh, stress-like uh, response or the male function of the OPC? Because I'm, I'm convinced that the wind 7 b is critical, right? So is that, because, is that because purely decreased number of OPC or is there this malfunction, uh, abnormal function of the OPC secreting the wind 7 b what, 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 what do you think? Um, yeah, if I understand well your question, the, yeah. um, actually it's a number of OPC, uh, it's a number of OPC reduced leading yeah. lead to the, um, what say the the wind ligands reduction uh, derived uh, wind derived OPC reduction, but not but not the secretion capacity of OPC changed because we also detected the uh, the wind ligands in purified OPC from our isolated mice and also control oh, mice. Okay. Yeah, great, great. <laughs> right. Uh, if no more, let me see. Is uh, uh, one question? Do you want to ask yourself? Ask or, myself. Uh, there's a question on the chat board. So you, you might you can type in your, your answers in, in the chat board. Okay, so you, great. If, 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 if uh, Lee don't want to, doesn't want to ask himself. Okay. Yeah, you, you check the uh, chat board, the question. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. I, so, I'm, I'm reading. Okay, yeah. great. Okay, you can, you can type in the, your answer over there. Yeah. Okay. Okay. okay, thank okay. you. You're open for, for Genia's work. Genia's talk. Yeah. Heron, thank okay. you. Thanks. Thanks, Chenju. Awesome talk. Thanks. It's a long. Um, okay, so it's my uh, great pleasure to introduce my friend and colleague, Genia Kazurabitsky. Did I pronounce that right? Perfect. Whew, I've been practicing all morning in the shower, like Kazurabitsky, Kazurabitsky. Okay, <laughs> got it. Okay. So um, Jenya is an associate professor in the Department of Neurobiology at Northwestern University. She received her uh, bachelor's degree at Princeton, uh, graduated uh, summa cum laude, that's 
the best, highest distinction. She then uh, stayed at Princeton to do a PhD with Elizabeth Gould. Uh, she had 10 papers, uh, worked on several projects centering around social behavior and neurogenesis. She was then selected into the prestigious Harvard Society of Fellows, uh, where she did postdoctoral work with Bernardo Sabatini in Harvard Medical School. And here she explored um, the role of neural activity of wiring the brain. Um, this phenomenon is well known um, in sensory cortices, um, but it was unknown if, if and how it worked um, in the basal ganglia because they don't receive uh, sensory um, inputs. And she had an important paper in Nature during her postdoc where she discovered how activity propagates through uh, a cortex basal ganglia uh, thalamus circuit to, um, to mediate uh, or to set up synaptic networks. And this is balanced by direct and indirect pathways. Um, in her own lab um, at Northwestern, she continues to work on stratum, dopamine signaling, but she's also pioneered technological innovations to empower neuroscience discoveries from imaging to proteomics, and she'll share some of that with us. Um, I think she received every award a junior faculty member can get. She received the Whitehall Foundation Award, the Beckman Young Investigator Award, the Sloan Research Fellowship. She was a Searle Scholar. Uh, she was a Vita Allen Scholar. And that's where I, where I first met her at the uh, Rita Allen meetings. So um, she's an awesome neuroscientist and looking forward to hearing the latest. Thank you so much for having me here. This is really wonderful. I'm gonna try to share my screen and see what happens. Okay. How does that look? Looks good. good. Okay. Um, you have to do the uh, slideshow view. I'm not on the slideshow view. Hmm. Uh, or maybe it's, oh, no, there it is. That's good. It works, right? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So uh, very broadly, my lab is interested in neuromodulatory signaling in its interactions with neuroplasticity and how neural circuits get established by early life uh, experience and neural activity. And, and broadly, this focus on neuromodulation is, I think, justified uh, in many ways. So neuromodulation expands the number of states that neural circuits can take, thereby enhancing computational capacity in the complex brain. We've come to recognize, I would say, over the last half a century or so that neuromodulatory signaling is crucial in controlling all sorts of essential behaviors, including things that are really fundamental for survival in all vertebrates, as well as things that, that we feel make us human. It's incredibly important in medicine in the sense that every disorder of the brain usually either has neuromodulation as some kind of explanatory mechanism uh, or potential for therapeutic intervention or both. And finally, it's just a fascinating biologically complex puzzle because many neuromodulatory systems have diffuse projections with a lot of uh, sometimes multiple co-released substances, interesting temporal dynamics of signaling and protein couple receptors and so on. And so we've, uh, so far over the last uh, few years of my lab, we've asked questions primarily focused on how neuromodulators acting through protein coupled receptors alter activity of cells and neuronal ensembles, how they sometimes structurally rewire neural circuits. Uh, and in the process of doing this work, we've we've come to feel that uh, some further tool development can be warranted. And so we've uh, tried to focus as well, I would say about a third of the lab does methods development, aiming at kind of controlling or evaluating things that relate to neuromodulation and plasticity. And in that context comes the study, uh, the couple of studies that I wanna share with you today uh, that are really is a sort of neuroscientist trying to do neuroproteomics a really really new venue for our lab we've gotten into thinking about how we can leverage genetically encoded proximity labeling um, and integrate that into our workflow that primarily aims at understanding synapses cells and circuits so all of this work is led by an extremely talented uh, soon to graduate phd student in our lab vasin dabrong prichachan and we really went after this proteomic level despite the challenge of the fact that we currently cannot yet amplify um, proteins instead of transcriptomic sequencing type approaches because we kept you know wondering 
which proteins are where in which networks and neurons are so you know functionally and structurally complex that uh, we really felt that at the level of protein was where we wanted to seek information and so there weren't such great uh, methods at that time used usable in the mouse brain but there's fantastic work uh coming from the lab of Alice Sting, and now several other people she's trained are working on this, uh, that relies on using uh, an engineered peroxidase called Apex. So it's a soybean peroxidase uh, that she's worked on for a long time. And you can use that or as well as some other enzymes to uh, very locally express them within a cell and induce the enzyme uh, in the case of Apex by providing biotin phenyl and inducing the reaction with H2O2, induce the enzyme to biotinylate very uh, locally located uh, proteins. So it'll tag proteins with a little tag, and then you can affinity purify them, run them using mass spectrometry, and try to understand the proteomic landscape of a neural system. So, at the time we got into this, uh, there's been really beautiful work done in cell culture using this kind of approach uh, with very elegant results. And there's one paper that uh, applied this in the fruit fly brain as well, but there hadn't been any uh, mouse neural circuits or systems work done with it. And what we really wanted to tap into is of course the rich uh, variety of Cree lines that exist that allow cell class specific targeting in the brain. And so we thought that uh, we should create tools that are Cree dependent so that you can, for example, uh, express an adeno, uh, an, an AAV in a particular part of the brain. Here we're targeting deep layer uh, neurons in the motor cortex, and then try to understand how their proteomic landscape might change as a function of either development or neural activity. And so the workflow for this is that the expression of apex occurs in vivo uh, and it's followed by an ex vivo biotinylation and the acute brain slice preparation, just like the prep that we regularly use in the lab for electrophysiology. And the first viruses were created for this purpose, which we're about to deposit on AdGene, happy to send it to anyone that is interested, uh, are of three flavors. One directs the apex to the nucleus. One is broadly expressed in cytosol with a nuclear export sequence, and one targets the membrane. And there's a 2A linker that separates uh, GFP, which will just be cytosolically expressed. And so you can see here a pattern of expression for these three viruses in the striatum, the large input region to the basal ganglia that's crucial for uh, complex motor actions and reward-based behavior. And so you can see that the GFP is relatively broadly distributed, but the same is not true for the results of uh, biotinylation visualized via streptavidin or a little flag tag that we can also see uh, to, to know where apex is. And so uh, getting this workflow to work in the mouse brain uh, is quite powerful because now we can ask proteomic questions, not just on the level of a brain region, but try to look at things within the context of their local circuit, preserve aspects, important aspects of morphology that uh, cell cultures don't capture. Uh, Apex2 has advantages over, let's say, BioID uh, in that it works really quickly. So you get a kind of a rapid snapshot of a time in the life of particular neurons. And of course, we can attain cell type and subcellular specificity. And we were able to take this to fairly efficient labeling that does not require, at least for most types of samples, subject pooling. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. So this is just a basic introductory a slide showing you the kind of uh, proteomics that we're doing. So you digest your sample, prepare peptides, biotinylate, uh, pull them out on using magnetic beads. And then we have chosen uh, the path of TMT labeling using isobaric tags, where you can label your different samples and then combine them so that they are run together uh, as a set of samples on mass spec. And there's also inference-based uh, ways of doing that without tagging, but we found that this TMT labeled approach really gives us the most reliable, easily analyzable sorts of data. And I want to acknowledge my collaborator, uh, Matt McDonald at uh, Pitt, who's really fantastic, fantastic uh, mass spectroscopy proteomics guy that we work with for this uh, research. So, you know, you. You know, I like the basal ganglia, and we decided to first target uh, striatal neurons uh, for this work. And we settled on comparing the two types of spiny striatal neurons that live in the striatum that uh, express different kinds of dopamine receptors and send non-overlapping projections, which you can see here 
go into SNR for the direct pathway spiny projection neurons and to the GPE for the indirect pathway ones. And this is really nice to have traction over these populations because if you look at just the cells themselves, they're intermingled uh, and they're rather similar looking to each other. So we need genetic traction in order to be able to evaluate their proteome. And here you can just see some Western blots where we demonstrate that you need both Cre uh, biotin phenol in order to be able to biotinylate the samples. You can see that for the D1 Cre uh, and for the A to A Cre samples. So that targets the indirect pathway spiny straight on neurons. And here's a total protein loading control. So uh, let's go with the workflow. We can readily identify a very large number of proteins, and then we impose a series of fairly strict cutoffs um, in order to be very confident that we're really looking at kind of Cree-dependent uh, and correctly targeted proteins. And so if you uh, make a whole lot of these comparisons, you can then basically boil your data down uh, to see what is enriched in the two cell types uh, of interest after you've made sure you removed any potential contaminants that aren't Cre, uh, biotin, phenol, and H202 dependent here. And uh, what is really nice to see is that a lot of the expected targets, such as the A2A receptor, uh, is enriched in the DRD2, A2A positive cells. The D1 receptor is enriched in DRD1 positive cells. And so we see that very clearly um, in the somatodendritic cytosolic proteome. And then we can also do the same thing for the nuclear proteome, where, of course, we enrich significantly fewer um, targets. And one interesting question uh, that the field you know, always tries to think about this, what is the strength of the relationship between RNA levels and protein levels? And we do find uh, compared to single cell uh, sequencing data sets that, you know, the correlation is really pretty solid. Uh, it's, not, it's not everything. Uh, and that suggests some interesting potential for the kind of regulatory things that can happen with proteins. And I'll mention a little more about that later, but we see very reliable uh, correlation with single cell sequencing for these cell types. So we can distinguish subcellular proteome and the markers correlate at transcript and protein levels reasonably well. So next we can try a more ambitious kind of experiment, right? I told you I was really interested in GPCR signaling. So can we actually detect a change downstream of some GPCR activation? And for the first experiment of this type, we chose a, a relatively simple, strong perturbation. We used a dread, one of the so-called activating dreads that uh, is the HM3D GQ coupled dread. And we decided to see whether we can pick up evidence of activation of direct pathway spiny striatal neurons. So for this experiment, you wanna co-express uh, we chose a nuclear apex uh, as well as either the HM3DQ virus or simply a control m cherry virus. And we did our injections neonatally to target uh, relatively early uh, developmental time windows. And then when the animals grew up after robust viral expression, we uh, injected clozapine and oxide to activate the dread. Uh, we confirmed that there's an expected effect of locomotor behavior that you would expect if you activate uh, direct pathway spiny projection neurons. And then we can start looking at the H2B enriched nuclear proteome in a specific comparison that looks at the activated neurons relative to the m cherry control. And what you can see here is that there's a few uh, targets should pop out that are known transcription factors. And that means that we can uh, reliably determine uh, not just you know, a single uh, transcription factor like CFOS, but rather a whole family, a whole network of factors that may be up or down regulated in reliable ways after biasing activity of a particular uh, set of neurons. And so this was really encouraging data and strengthens uh, you know, the expectation that we can use this tool now uh, in the context of kind of circuit perturbative types of experiments that we do in many systems. Next, we went a little bit further, and this work is about to be uh, preprinted, hopefully this week or next, uh, in creating a Cree dependent apex reporter mouse line. Uh, because we really wanted to target some of these extremely interesting things that are happening very early postnatally, and we didn't have time to, to wait for AAV expression and couldn't get it to happen early enough. So in this early postnatal period, when all of these fascinating dynamics happen with OPCs and astrocytes uh, and early stress has such a big impact, that's sort of the, the target time that we really wanted to understand. And that could not be done very easily using AAVs. 
And so we uh, wanted to make a reporter that you could just cross to your favorite Cree line in order to do these experiments. And to do this, we used CRISPR uh, to target the, the ROSA, the permissive ROSA locus, and basically used a version of our nuclear export uh, AAV plasmid in order to create a mouse line. And here you can see a reporter cross for a V-glut CRE uh, targeting glutamatergic neurons where you see cells in the cortex, no cells in the striatum, cells in the hippocampus, and then the layers of the cerebellum that house uh, excitatory granule neurons. So it looks like it might work. Uh, for actual biology, we focused on the development of corticostriatal axons uh, and specifically targeting some of the time windows from the, the earliest time after birth to try to understand the local axonal proteome, especially well aligned uh, to proteomics because you can't, you know, you can't use uh, transcription to really know exactly what are the proteins that are in the axons. And so we focused on these cortical inputs to the striatum for this work. And here you can see uh, immunoenhanced uh, reporter cross at postnatal days 5, 15, 20, and 40, reasonably close to adulthood. Uh, and we constrain the time windows that we targeted based on uh, what is known about the time windows of development of uh, corticostriatal axons. So as expected, we were able to attain uh, Cree-dependent biotinylation in both cortical and striatal samples with distinct pattern of expression with axonal expression of biotinylation in the striatum and soma only visible in the cortex as expected. And we really focused our analysis from here onwards on the striatum where you have a pure axonal uh, signal in this case. So we ran our uh, experiments and found that uh, the data we obtained had a lot of really interesting patterns in it, which clustered nicely into some number of clusters. Uh, you could do four, you could do eight, and you could see that certain proteins over this uh, time period from neonate to the adult uh, increased in expression, others decreased, and some were a little bit more kind of U-curve-like. And what's also interesting is that these clusters uh, obtained via regression modeling uh, showed differential enrichment in particular different types of biologically significant pathways and also were differentially enriched in genes that have been associated with human disorders. For example, uh, cluster two was very abundant in genes linked to ASD spectrum disorders uh, and bipolar disorder popped up somewhat surprisingly to me in this cluster eight that shows a pretty strong down regulation of expression. And so we think this data set, all of which of course we will make public along with the uh, analytical framework provides a useful framework for evaluating axonal proteome uh, linking to signaling pathways and try to connect this data to what is known about uh, human disease risk genes. We also carried out, of course, pathway-centric uh, CAG axon guidance analysis uh, and confirmed that axon development as expected is regulated by a lot of important kinases, phosphatases, uh, and GTPases. And through our data, uh, some of which had been linked to development, others not so much, uh, you can now go in and basically figure out you know, who is kind of co-varying or not co-varying in interesting way with each other uh, among the proteins of interest to you. Another really important thing we were able to get done is to relate protein levels to post-translational modifications. For starters, just phosphopeptides. That's really important because the level of the protein doesn't tell you everything. Phosphorylation state determines function in a significant way. And we wanted to ask first a simple question. Uh, well, first, can we do this? And second, do our proteins vary uh, with our phosphopeptides? And we were able to uh, quantify a number of phosphopeptides per protein, and phosphopeptides themselves showed their own consistent clustering patterns. But how does that relate to protein levels? Well, perhaps not surprisingly, majority of proteins with mapped phosphocytes, so a protein phosphocyte pair, uh, varied, co-varied in, in a positive way, right? They were correlated uh, in a positive way. But occasionally, we found some number of proteins that had a phosphocyte that was negatively regulated. So it was negatively correlated. And so that's potentially quite functionally important because this means that even as a protein rises or falls, this specific phosphocyte is starting to do something very different than the total protein levels, perhaps pointing to functional importance. And so we looked a little bit uh, more closely into uh, one such uh, deviant 
protein phosphoside pair, a uh, very important protein, TSC2. So that's in the mTOR pathway, uh, strongly associated with certain ASD spectrum disorders. And it has this different pattern uh, of developmental trajectory compared to this specific phosphoside S664. And what's interesting is that this is uh, located in the context of potentially a kind of a very important early development uh, uh, signal in cascade and we wanted to see whether this is really true in our data so this is a kind of a cascade mapping that's grounded in both uh, proteomic level data as well as phosphoproteomic and we thought this was an interesting question because there's a, a strong model for axonal development that's been proposed and evaluated primarily in the context of retinal ganglia cells uh, that posits efferent and efferent receptor mediated signaling interaction with MAPK and TSC2 uh, as, as you know, a modulator of mTOR activity uh, and uh, something that drives a decrease in protein synthesis. So we asked, is this happening in our data? And the answer to that is yes. So we found uh, the expected increase in epinephrine receptor levels, and then downstream every path of the way here, uh, we were able to confirm that this uh, retinal model of development actually probably pretty strongly maps onto what is happening in the striatum. So it's sort of the summary of the full signaling cascade that's thought to regulate uh, axon growth and axon cone collapse. So that's really everything I want to share with you today. Uh, we generated quite a few resources here that are available uh, for the community, and we hope that people will start using them broadly. Uh, and in the future, we hope to combine um, proteomics with some additional omics for a more complete story and a deeper understanding of these differences between RNA and protein levels and functions. Uh, and we're really interested uh, to dive deeper into state-dependent proteomics for a few different types of questions, including how uh, neurons and non-neuronal cells may change in response to stress. Uh, and finally, uh, further dive into developmental neuroproteomics, both in the context of baseline development of neural systems and in disease models. And with that, I want to thank my lab uh, and the funding sources and you for your time. Awesome talk, Jinya. Uh, thanks so much. We have time for questions. There's a couple in the chat. Um, those look like the pre previous, the previous one. one. Okay. Yeah. I have a question. <laughs> oh, hi, I'm good. Uh, so it's it's very exciting to see the the in vivo uh, proximity labeling. I have actually a question about: Did you ever try maybe doing a DAB EM? Because uh, like if you sparse label cells with apex, and then you can increase the contrast, and yes, then no. you can trace um like single neurons, like what uh Kahal did a hundred years ago, and now you can do even better tracing of the EM of the distal end of the. Yeah, it, it, it actually works really, really well. We especially like the membrane uh, targeted construct uh, because you get better visualization within, uh, you know, within dendrites, for example. And, and yes, yeah, so there's a, a couple of images uh, in the Nature Communications paper already, and um, we've used it for other projects as well. It, it works quite nicely, especially the membrane bond construct. Well, the LCK is uh, just using the transmembrane domain or using the full, full length protein? Uh, I think just using the transmembrane domain. I see. Good. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Want to keep it small? Yeah. Well. Yeah. It's a. It's a, it's a kindness. So if you always try, that, it might, yeah, might yeah, yeah. do something. Else. You don't yeah. want it to do crazy stuff. Right, right. Cool. <laughs> Thank you. Other questions? I have a um, technical question. I wanted to. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Oh, okay. So, because uh, um, you mentioned that uh, first you cut the brain into slices. I wonder how thick you cut the brain slice, because um, if you do this apex labeling, I, I, uh, what I think is that uh, maybe the biotin, the substrate, may be hard to get into the deep inside of the slice, you know. So I just wanted to ask about that. Yeah. Yeah, that's a really excellent question. So we tend to section a little bit thinner for this prep for the exact reasons that you mentioned, uh, then for slice physiology. So somewhere more in the 250 micron range. Uh, and we've actually tried to rigorously quantify the depth of biotin penetration. It's a little bit difficult. You can't do it with antibody because <sighs> they don't penetrate. 
Um, mm. And so we tried a, a little bit with click chemistry, but we could still see that we are reagent penetration limited based on incubation times. And we just kind of, you know, we kind of gave up slightly. You'd have to basically uh, incubate and then uh, put it into something that allows you to resection. That would be the way to do that. And we've stopped short of resectioning 250 micron sections uh, to really get in the middle to see if you uh, have labeled. Yeah, I think 250, that's, that's, that's a good uh, number. I think it's a thing enough, at least for me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the fact that we can get even with viral labeling that can be relatively sparse, that we can do single sample quantification without having to go to very sophisticated mass spec approaches that are targeted sort of single cell proteomics means, uh, you know, we have enough material. Thank you. Can I ask a question? Please, yeah. go ahead. Yeah, so uh, I, I know you make the uh, Rosa knocking mouse. So I know the expression level in this in the, uh, in the knocking is usually not a, that, that a high, like transgenic. In your mouse, do you require a specific age to let the reporter express and then you get the good results? Um, so what we've done for the axonal proteomics work is, you know, in the earliest like P4, P4 timeline with a sparse uh, kind of projection that's not necessarily everything that's coming into the region, uh, we would sometimes combine samples. Anything well, P4 is really early, early stage, right? Yeah, yeah early. exactly. Oh. So really early, you might run into some trouble unless you're looking at the very large scale projection. Uh, or you're looking at soma. I think if you want to do somatic P4, no problem mm -hmm. at all. Uh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, That's cool. That said, you know, as as you're totally right, uh, a lot of those lines don't have super strong expression. We actually we see that in the GFP. The GFP looks uh -huh. really really weak. And one other thing that we did in the uh, initial work that we're still kind of working further with that is to see whether there's a. We use two transgenes. So we just bred them to homozygosity to make sure that we have more apex in there. I'm not sure if that's strictly necessary, but it may be very useful early in development. We're, we're now doing a comparison of single gene versus two alleles. Yeah, another thing I'm thinking about, because the P4 is really early, actually, uh, when you use this knocking mouse. So is that means that your MS, uh, MS uh, technique is very sensitive, then can detect a very low amount of the protein there. Uh, you're helped a lot by using TMT. If you make very clean samples and then you use isobaric tagging, uh, you can combine 16 samples together and that helps. And we can actually readily fractionate those samples too and even have enough to run uh, phosphopeptides. Okay, thank you so much. Great. That's where TMT helps a lot. Cool. Other questions? What are the next uh, post-translational modifications you're going to try to find? The, the phosphoproteomics looked really cool. Uh, I mean, I feel like I feel like we don't understand phospho in a way that is grounded in real data, right? From your sample. So, and I think some of the others are potentially a little bit harder. So I'm going to stick with phospho for a little bit because it's hard enough as it is. We, we had to make up, you know, the analytics for this grounded in proteomics from the cell types didn't really exist. And it's a little bit, it was a little bit tricky, definitely took a while. And I'm interested in sort of novel peptides that aren't like cryptic peptides that shouldn't be produced. I'm just wondering how deep of sequencing or do you ever find, do you think you're empowered to find sort of non-reference proteins like sort of cryptic yeah. isoforms or weird that sort of things that's really really tricky it would be lovely to be able to do that but the problem is right so is that the inference methods are kind of biased yeah. against yeah. finding cryptic things yeah i wonder whether maybe you know doing certain perhaps certain top-down approaches might be help. like if you're looking at some complexes right using top-down approaches you might be able to do a little bit better where you're really looking at proteoforms very carefully in in very small samples with top-down Iran, i have a comment on that so depends on how big your peptide 
uh, peptides, uh, the interest of your peptides are actually the, uh, what I, if I remember correct, the, the apex labeling, you only, uh, the, the reactive, um, um, the reactive um, biotin only attack tyrosine residues. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, in such a case, if you, for, for sterile peptide, it may not uh, have any tyrosine though. So that's uh, yeah, unfortunately, every enzymatic labeling approach has a particular residue, and that's its strength. It's also its its flaw. Uh, but at least Apex is fast, so we've we've liked working with it a lot. And it's really small; you can easily direct it to lots of places. And it seems to work in fixed tissue, like for that EM contrast. Uh, kind of incredible. Okay, so yeah, that was an amazing talk, Dinya and Chenju also. So thanks so much for joining us. They ended up being very complimentary. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thanks, Chenju. Great. Great talks. Thank you. Thank, right. you. Thank you. Bye, everyone.